Hello everyone, and welcome to the XM Pro 4.3 release showcase. My name is Kim Marie Davenport, product manager here at XM Pro, and I'm excited to share with you the highlights of this release in terms of what the features are, they do, and why you would benefit from applying them in your XM Pro environment. If you have any questions, please send them through and we'll cover them at the end. Before we begin, I'd like to point out that today's content builds on a couple of prior webinars. If you haven't already watched them, I'd highly recommend that you do so. You can find them on our XM Pro channel in YouTube. XM Pro CEO, Peter van Skolpeg, explains the concept of the Intelligent Digital Twin Suite. As well as going into detail on our product strategy, the Intelligent Digital Twins Framework, also known as XM Pro I3C, which stands for Integrated, Intelligent, Interactive, and Composable. While that I3C framework is a longer term view of where we're heading, Daniel King's Product Roadmap webinar describes the items we're working on now and next to get us there. Every initiative that we work on falls under one of the four pillars of the XM Pro product namely Accelerate Transformation, AI and Engineering, Zero Trust Architecture, and the Cloud to Edge Continuum. Together, they support each of our three themes, faster time to value, distributed intelligence, and security across deployments. This triangle layout illustrates how each of these pillars support one another, as well as their varying impact on people, process, and technology. The 4.3 release contains new features for both the Cloud to Edge Continuum and AI and Engineering Excellence. Kicking off with the Cloud to Edge Continuum, there are three features included in 4.3. Distributed caching through Redis allows us to run the distributed infrastructure needed in Cloud to Edge computing. The other two features are complementary. Health Check Endpoints is about detecting an issue and roughly where that issue lies. And logging enables the going in and doing analysis around finding that problem. They are important groundwork on our journey to be more agnostic, more performant, and more scalable, allowing data to be accessed along that continuum. Now, a health check endpoint is precisely as it sounds. A product service has a health check API endpoint, such as HTTP forward slash health, that returns the health of the service. When it is called, the API endpoint handler performs various checks and responds with the simple status of the API and its dependencies, healthy or unhealthy. When IT is troubleshooting, health checks are the industry standard for the first diagnostic step. They quickly indicate connectivity health, either highlighting an issue such as access to a database or allowing the troubleshooter to rule out connectivity and move on to their next check. We've implemented standard best practice health check endpoints with two different ways to consume this information, in person or utilizing a diagnostic tool. As a baseline, a person can monitor the health UI, which sits outside of our product. It has to, or you wouldn't be able to access it if our products were not healthy. However, there is more to be gained by configuring the raw JSON API response to be read by diagnostic tools, such as Azure with App Insights, so that the endpoints are constantly monitored on the infrastructure itself. You can build rules triggered if it goes from healthy to unhealthy, and when triggered, you can build actions such as an email or a Teams message, or maybe even to auto-scale. Health endpoints are crucial for enabling self-healing functionalities in your infrastructure. Being able to automatically restart unhealthy services on the edge is extremely powerful in increasing product uptime 
and performance. Imagine if your application is running on Kubernetes and you can automatically restart the service or the pod that it's running on and hopefully get it back to a healthy state. The health checks are particularly useful for customer installations on their own infrastructure. There's always a risk that connectivity might not have been opened on a service that XMPro needs, and it's not transparent that this is the case. Time has been lost in previous installations going through that diagnosis process. It requires certain skill sets, so it becomes time consuming and costly to troubleshoot, what may end up being a trivial issue. With health checks, now when you do the initial installation, you could, for example, confirm application designer has connectivity to subscription manager and to its database. If it doesn't, then we can tell straight away that it can't connect and see the relevant error message. The problem is narrowed down to connectivity between two systems, and it's simple to proceed to the next step, which could be something like opening an exception on the firewall. There are also day-to-day -day operations where the environment in which XM Pro is installed unexpectedly changes, whether it's the cloud server running updates, sorry, whether it's the cloud provider running updates or deprecating underlying functionality, or the customer themselves making changes. These endpoints are available so that XM Pro connectivity can be actively monitored. If connectivity is inadvertently broken, someone can be proactively notified of an issue and investigate further. The loss of connectivity assists in knowing which area is working as expected and which area to troubleshoot further. Let me take you to our product documentation for a quick look. This is the, sorry, this is the health path of an application designer services URL and the raw API response. Note the overall status is healthy and that there is an entry for each of the related product service APIs, as well as the database. Observe the duration for each individual check, their healthy status, as well as the optional descriptive tags. Next, we'll look at the same information using the baseline health UI. Here we can see in the top half the same information for application designer, but it is a lot easier on the human eye. The overall status is healthy. And again, there are entries for each related product service API, as well as the database. Observe again the duration for each check, their healthy status, as well as the optional descriptive tags. Our documentation includes an example of how to configure the XM Pro products, as well as how to add third-party systems that have health endpoints. A reminder that how you choose to use these health checks is up to you. Our product is decoupled from any specific cloud provider so that XM Pro remains platform independent. So now that you know roughly where the problem is, how do you solve it? Previously, we had log files being written to the web server. You had to be an administrator, log into that service, download the log files, and then view a large text file full of logs. This has issues of accessibility and security. You can't open access to many people because of the security constraint, and it's time consuming to get access to those logs. Then once you get them, you just see a wall of text. You don't get any of the benefits of AI insights, anomalies, or trending analytics. You can't see there's been a spike in latency to a certain endpoint request, or multiple 500 error codes coming back from another endpoint. Your native service provider can't consume the logs and pair them with telemetry, information about the infrastructure service that's running your application, like CPU and RAM. So we've done three things in 4.3. We've added more logging, 
added more context to that logging, and then made those logs available to services that are optimized for monitoring and analyzing the data in those logs. When we say we've added more product application logging, what this means is that we've increased the number of messages that are logged to expose how the product is working internally. This gives more insight for troubleshooting diagnostics and optimi optimization purposes. Where previously an endpoint may have been receiving a lot of requests, hypothetically recommendations, and taking a long time to process them, this was not visible if the request was not logged. Now that the endpoints are logged, it is visible and allows designers to optimize how applications and streams are implemented to improve overall performance. We've added more context where possible to each log. So if there's a user ID associated, we always put the user ID on it. If there's a company ID, we always put the company on it. When you look at the log, you have more context as to which area it relates to. This gives users finer grained information when they You can stay with the logs being written to file on the service or take advantage of the new feature, logging provider support, to send the output to third party logging providers like Azure Application Insights or Datadog for centralized monitoring analysis. They are specialists in this area and provide fantastic features for searching, monitoring, dashboarding, and alerting. For example, you could search the logs for a specific user or recommendation. And we're doing this in an industry standard way using best practices of a standard platform independent logging provider, logging library. The benefit is that we can quickly and easily add support for more providers if you request one that we don't have. In summary, application logging is essential for troubleshooting and debugging as it helps identify and analyze issues that may arise during the application's execution. It also provides valuable insights into the application's performance, usage patterns, and security. Near the end of 2022, we heard feedback from a customer that the distributed caching was not working as expected on AWS. Despite Scaling up and out the resources, some app pages were slow and some were timing out. These performance issues were due to the large volume of data in memory. With the 4.3 release, the timeouts have been fixed across all platforms by refactoring our implementation of distributed data. We're still using Redis or Remote Dictionary Server a popular open source data structure store, but we're using it more effectively by breaking the memory used into smaller pieces. These are more easily managed by Redis to handle larger volumes of memory and cache faster, which is passed on to the users who experience those faster response times. Data caching is a technique to improve the performance and responsiveness of applications, where frequently accessed data is stored in memory, a fast and easily accessible location, rather than a time-consuming operation like accessing a database. Distributed caching is when it is stored in an external service accessible by one or more servers. It is mandatory when you scale out and run more than one instance of our product. I'm showing the typical architecture for AWS, but it is the same concept on other platforms. And you can view their typical architecture on our product. Your cloud native implementation handles adding resources by basically cloning the web service. They're out of the box load balancer, such as AWS Elastic Beanstalk or Azure App Service determines which web service the user's browser connects to as soon as you scale out. But when different browsers and stream hosts talk to any of the web server instances, the cache data must give the same results. 
In the example of an app page that is initially loaded, everyone will see the same published app page because it's saved in the database. When someone edits that app page, in order for every other user to see those changes near real time, those changes must be stored somewhere in memory that all the servers, server instances access. With distributed caching, we move that in-memory data out of the individual web servers and into Redis. The end result is that the web server instances all access the same memory, allowing the clients connected to the different servers to see those changes in near real time too. There's a lot of functionality in our product that uses cached data. For example, streaming data from a stream host or multiple stream hosts connecting to application designer where the stream hosts are clients as well. The main reason for scaling is performance. For example, if the CPU was high for data streams and you had many streams running, you could scale up by increasing the app service plan in Azure but there is a limit to how high you can go. This is when you would scale out to get more CPU. So one reason is for performance to scale up and out. The second reason is resiliency. For example, if you had data stream designer on Azure App Service Plan 2, and it had an issue where the performance was deprecated for some reason, users would be locked out. However, if you had two instances at a lower service plan and one of those had an issue that caused performance to be degraded, the users would be able to continue to use the product on the second instance. So resiliency is another factor. The third benefit is cost. Technically, you can auto scale out and in again automatically or on a schedule to better manage your infrastructure costs in peak periods. Early benchmarking results indicate that using distributed caching has performance improvements even when you are running only one instance of the product. And so is something you may want to consider switching to for larger production ready implementations, such as those with a large number of data streams. Once more, we have two complementary features from a pillar included in 4.3, this time for AI and engineering intelligence. Neither a data scientist nor a designer wants to create a model in one environment and manually load them into data stream designer each time they change. XMPro Notebook provides data scientists with the ability to work within the XMPro product suite to create models using scientific computing. And our MLflow agent enables effective model governance to run the production model version against live event data in a data stream. We'll end off with the significant performance improvements to the time series chart block, enabling quicker data retrieval for longer periods. XM Pro Notebook is a new product released for freemium in 4.3. Existing customers and freemium users can contact us for access and licensing options. This is an embedded Jupyter notebook, providing a familiar interface for data science, scientific computing, and machine learning. Data scientists, analysts, and engineers will be able to access data to innovate within the XM Pro suite. We've added built-in chat GPT functionality to help you in the process. For example, you can ask it to create code to represent data in a certain visualization. When you're done, you can save the file and execute it using our Python agent as embedded AI, or you can apply governance. Leverage the MLflow library to commit the model to your repository right from within XMPro Notebook for use in a data stream. This was just a small test of XM Pro Notebook. In last month's webinar, Gavin Green presented a hands-on demonstration of AI in Intelligent Digital Twins, which is a fully extended version that explains these features and more in detail. 
it is well worth watching. Moving on to MLflow. As AI scales within the organization, corporate guardrails require AI to be modeled within an MLOps framework. You don't want to end up with models stored in a variety of places and lose track of which is the latest version or where it is located. MLflow Agent is the first in a series that enables effective model governance using a popular MLOps toolset. Let us know if you are using a different repository. This empowers data scientists to promote new model versions within MLflow without going back to edit the data stream. Let's see this in action. My thanks to Chris for recording this demo as soon as I find my mouse. In it, we have an MLflow agent configured to use version one of a model called Wine Quality. Once the data stream is published, observe that the first event confirms model version one was used to make a prediction. Now we'll change over to MLflow and promote version two to production. Going back to the data stream, without reconfiguring or republishing, observe that model version two is seamlessly used to make the next prediction. Application Designer's Time Series Chart, or TSC, is one of our most popular data visualizations. However, we found that performance is not satisfactory with large volumes of data. And as you know, this is usually the case with time series data. All relevant data is returned to the client for processing so that it doesn't need to be refreshed unless certain parameters are changed. But large volumes of data are slow to return and slow to process on the client. We've made changes to the block itself and released a specialized TSC connector that only returns the data points displayed on that chart. The block sends the requested parameters to the connector, which retrieves the data from the data source, crunches the numbers, and sends back only the data actually displayed. For example, rather than sending 60,000 records for 180 buckets, we're only returning 180 records. This results in a fast and scalable user experience. The disadvantage of this approach is that it is repeated every time the chart is interacted with, such as zooming or changing the asset selection. A TSC SQL connector is available now, and the functionality will be rolled out for Azure Data Explorer and Historian next. You will need the 4.3 release for the block enhancement and thereafter, simply load the new connectors as they are made available. Alternatively, you can continue using the original connectors for smaller data volumes to avoid the load between interactions. Have a demo by Dragon, another one of our talented developers of the new connector in action. We discovered during a trial run through that my audio is not going to play, or the audio of the video is not going to play through from you. So this is my first run through with a script. So let's just see how that goes when we play the video. This is the new TSC SQL connector, which is pulling the selected fields that we have for this time range and this interval size. We can see that the request was returning in less than 400 milliseconds and the size is 44, 45 kilobytes. If I open the request now, we can see that we have 179 records or buckets. And for each packet, we have the selected field with their corresponding min and max values that are actually showing on this one. Now, what we've said is if we move the range, it's going to send a new request, the same size and the same time. If we move the range, 
sorry. If we increase or decrease the interval size, we should have double the buckets. Sarah, do we have any questions? Thanks very much, Kim, um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, yes, we've got one question here about uh, where can we find some more information on 4.3 or any other release? I would encourage you to go to our product documentation and look at both the What's New article as well as the release notes for further details on the features presented to you today, as well as the smaller enhancements and fixes that were released. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, thanks. Thanks again, Kim. Thank you so much for taking us through all that. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you're looking for more information, you can contact Kim or our team directly. We are running these webinars monthly and our next session will be an extended session on XMPRO AI end-to-end -end use cases, covering intelligence through proactive recommendations and implementing machine learning through XMPRO AI. You can register using this QR code uh, that Kim's sharing on her screen or we'll send you the link um, when we send out the recording of this session shortly. Um, we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you very much. Thank you.